Hello and welcome to East Somerville Main Street's candidate forum and debate for Ward 1 Alderman. My name is Joe Lynch from the Somerville Media Center, commonly known as SCAT TV. I'm a member of the Board of Directors there, I'm host of a weekly talk show at Greater Somerville, and Vice Chair of the Ward 5 Somerville City Democratic Committee. It is my pleasure to be asked to moderate this event, and I'm thrilled to see all of you here participating in Democracy in Action. Thank you very much to Teresa and Devin, and all the folks at East Somerville Main Streets. Thank you to the staff from the Somerville Media Center who are taping this event tonight. This event will be made available to the general public later this week. And as an added treat for all of you, the Somerville Main Streets is also streaming this on Facebook Live as we speak. So welcome again to Connection. Justin, thank you for your hosting. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome the candidates. Uh, let me see, they are for Ward 1 Alderman in the great city of Somerville, incumbent Alderman Matt McLaughlin and challenger Elliot <coughs> LaRusso. Applause. Okay, so thanks to a terrific audience, now if you can all do me a big favor. This is the candidates night, and in order to give them and the public who will see this show later on the time needed to get their message across, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. No audible applause, cheers, or other audience reactions to the statements or answers. And at the end of the program, I promise you, I'll give you sufficient time to show your appreciation. So here we go. The rules that were established by the East Somerville Main Streets organization for the forum and debate are as follows. Each candidate will be invited to deliver a two-minute opening statement. Matt McLaughlin. You won that flip? Ah, I was testing this. Daniel LaRusso won that flip, so he's going to deliver his two minute opening statement. The questions were gathered, edited, and formatted by the East Somerville Main Streets organization, and they were provided to me earlier today. Each candidate will be allowed a two minute response to each question. The candidates will be asked the same question. There is a timekeeper visible to me and the candidates and will signal to us when the time is up. Each candidate will be invited to deliver a two minute closing at the moderator's discretion, and that would be me. Due to the time constraints that we have and with the candidate's approval, we may dispense with those two minute closing statements. We're ready to begin. Candidates, you ready? Ready. We're gonna have a two minute opening statement from candidate Elio LaRusso. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody here at Connexion. Welcome, uh, thank you, Justin, for having us here this evening. Thank you for East Summer Main Streets for sponsoring this debate. Joe Lynch and moderating the East Summer Media Center for broadcasting. My name is Elliot Russo, and I'm a candidate for all of you Ward 1. I've been a lifelong resident of Ward 1. I'm invested in Ward 1. I'm a property owner and a business owner in Ward 1. I own Somerville Fundamental Buying Works, a local Rhode Island company located on George Street. I live at 11 George Street with my wife, Jusalia, and my eight year old daughter, Maria Gabriella, who attends the East Somerville Community School in the third grade. As a child, I watched both my parents, immigrants from Italy, seeking a new opportunity in America. They decided to make Ward 1 their home. That's where they raised myself and my sister Maria on George Street. And that's where I'm raising my daughter, Maria Gabriella, who attends the December Maria School. I attended the Little Flower School on Franklin Street and graduated with a BA Criminal Justice in Southern University. When I entered my family business in 1996, I had a dream to bring that business to the next level, and I achieved that goal. When I took over, we only had four employees in 1996, and today we employ nine employees from all different types of backgrounds. I am proud of my achievements in giving a chance for people to make a living here in America. I entered this race 
because I invested in the community and I find public service rewarding. My skills and abilities provide a background for all residents of Worldwide and the city of San Diego. So many issues simply must be addressed. Smart economic development, affordable housing, road issues, public safety, elder and veteran services. Do I have to stop opening this to people? You're being told to stop. <laughs> thank you, Elia. Matt McLaughlin, opening statement. Hey everyone, thank you all for coming. My name is Matt McLaughlin. I'm a fourth generation Somerville resident, fourth generation veteran who served in Iraq. Uh, I am a, li a lifelong Somerville resident, youth advocate, labor <coughs> activist, and Ward 1 Alderman for the past four years, which has been one of my greatest honors of my life. I do believe uh, that my theme this year is actions, not words, because I believe that we can use a lot of words, but actions and accountability is what is important. Uh, four years ago, I campaigned on a platform of affordable housing, youth services, opiate, epidemic, opiate addiction treatment and services, and local jobs. And I've just delivered on all four of those issues. I've delivered on my entire platform from four years ago. We increased the affordable housing percentage from 12 to 20 percent, the highest rate in the state. Uh, youth services have doubled under my uh, time as an alderman. Opiate epidemic, uh, we have police and fire department. Terry Narcan, which was one of the first things I did when I got on the Board of Aldermen. It saved hundreds of lives since 2014, and I'm very proud to know that there are people alive today because I spoke up on that issue. And uh, local job hiring. We have uh, Federal Realty and US2 and Union Square have both committed to uh, local hiring preference uh, in the Union Square zoning in particular. Um, and on top of that, I've also take care of the day-to-day -day activities around here. I've submitted over 600 board orders in the community, and I follow up on all of them. It's the highest amount of board orders on the Board of Aldermen, and I always follow up. I'm always accountable and responsive to my neighbors. I have an email list. I talk to people on social media. I'm very accountable and very accessible. Uh, so I am running on my record. Uh, there's a lot that more needs to get done. I'm committed to getting sound barriers on I-93, which will address air pollution as well as noise pollution. I want to increase affordable housing options in the city because 20% is a lot and it's not enough. And I want to deal with traffic and common measures like the Neighbor Waste Program that I'm spearheading in the ward. I look forward to talking about all these issues and talking about my actions and what I'd like to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to move on to the Q&A portion and uh, I'm going to ask Matt McLaughlin the first question. So both of you, Matt McLaughlin, Russo, like me, you grew up here in the city. You have very, very strong ties to the city. As new residents and businesses discover and move into East Somerville, how do you propose bridging that gap between old Somerville and new Somerville? I'm going to start with that. Well, that's interesting because uh, my theme from four years ago was something old, something new because I'm a young guy, I grew up here in the city, uh, I have deep roots here, but I also see the change happening, and uh, the big thing I tell people is, you know, some people grew up here in the change, and now I tell people I want us to be a part of the change. That's the only reason some people fear the change, the differences going on in the community. I would say that I've been very accessible to new and old Somerville and immigrant Somerville in this community. I reach out to people regularly. I have an email list of over a thousand residents on it. I'm sure a lot of you got that email, and that's why you're here today. Um, I hold more community meetings than almost any other all in the ward. I knock the doors even when there's not an election, and I knock doors with translators as well. Just yesterday, I was knocking doors with people who speak uh, Indian, uh, Pakistan, and Nepalese languages to reach out to people. It was kind of I could have spent more time talking to regular voters, but it was important to me to reach out to everyone in the community. Uh, business interests as well. We have this wonderful Broadway streetscape, which has increased the business along Broadway. I've helped a lot of these businesses obtain liquor licenses, obtain um, parking of the uh, outdoor seating, which I'm a big promoter of, and help them through the zoning process to make sure that their business can thrive. So I think that I'm very open and accessible to a lot of people, and I view everyone as my constituents regardless of if you can vote, regardless of if you vote for me. Uh, I'm always there for people and I'm always going to Thank you, Matt. Elio. 
that's that's a no-brainer. My childhood experience of growing up in Ward One, attending grammar school, becoming an adult, providing a solid background for my endeavors and representing all the people of the ward and all the people of the city. We are a, we are an ever-changing city. All right, and somebody like myself who's been invested here has seen the changes over the last thirty years, forty years. So we have we have a thriving neighborhood assembly. A member of my church at St. Benedict's Parish, we, we, we do an outreach program with the Good Assembly and try to bring in those people to our church. I was talking with Justin earlier about how the attendance at his, at his church is. And he feels it's good. People come from other communities. But we need to do more to outreach and make everybody part of this community. We are all neighbors here. We have children that, get, that, that attend the, the, the school system. So that we want to bring everybody together, make it inclusive, as inclusive as possible. And I have I have numerous times spoken with people in my own neighborhood. You know, we see a change. I mean, every every few months we see new people moving in and moving out, and we want to keep them here and we want to make it affordable for them to stay in our neighborhood. Thanks, Elio. So I'm going to give you the next one. Okay. The mayor and the alderman passed a resolution declaring this city a sanctuary city. If you support it, why? And if you oppose it, why? That's a no-brainer also. My parents are immigrants. They came to this country in 1967. I employ immigrants. I support it. I, I support the sanctuary city. We are a welcoming community. We have to make sure that when they come here, they respect the laws and they respect what, what needs to happen. Um, I'm always around immigrants. I have nine immigrants that work for me. Uh, my, most of my subcontractors are immigrants. So that's that's America right now, and that's Samoa right now. Ward one has a real high immigrant community, and we need to we need to accept them, and we need to educate them that we are a welcoming community, and we are going to make sure that they are well received. In this community, like myself, I've invested. I've seen. I've seen this community. I remember in the '80s when the big, when the Haitian community moved in, and then the Brazilians moved in in the late '90s. My wife came to this country in 1998. In fact, she settled in some of it. She, she's from. She's a Brazilian. Brazilian immigrant. So I know firsthand how the immigrant community is accepted here, and we have to meet them. Part of this, part of this community, because it's their community. We share our children go to school with them, so we have to make them. We have to make them appreciated for what what we have. We can't be pushing them out. We need to keep them here. Thanks, Elio. Now, let me repeat. No, thank you. I get the question, um, and I am a strong supporter of sanctuary cities in the city, and I am a strong supporter of the immigrant community in the city. Uh, a couple of things that I've done outside of the sanctuary city ordinance. Uh, is I helped increase the language liaisons in the city of Somerville who speak Spanish, Portuguese, and French Creole. They were part-time employees. In the first budget meeting I went to, I said these should be full-time employees because we have full-time people who need help in this community. Uh, the city approved that and the workload has not decreased at all. It's only increased. Uh, I've helped community needs in Spanish and Portuguese and French Creole. Uh, again, I have canvassed the neighborhoods, talking to people who work translators. Uh, I know our school committee members are on top of learning Spanish. I'm firing myself, but I gotta, gotta get over that Boston accent. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm working on it as well. Luck with that, man. <laughs> um, so yes, I am a strong supporter of immigrants in the community. I have a track record for record to prove it. Uh, people in the community will know they can reach out to me. And I hate to point out one thing, but at LEO, I do believe um, when the Sanctuary City Ordinance was passed in 2014, uh, you said that anybody who voted for this should be voted out of office. Uh, so I don't think that's accurate, and I think my actions as a supporter of Sanctuary City speak for themselves. Thank you, Matt. Let me let me stay with it for a little bit. So East Somerville is one of the most diverse neighborhoods in the city. It has its challenges. If those challenges are different than your own, and you you, you hold a slightly different view. How are you going to expect, uh, how do you expect to hold yourself in public office and bridge those divides? 
So you may not completely agree with certain city policies, but you represent a very, very diverse community. So we're gonna start with Ilya on that. You know what, Justin, good question. I wanna make one thing straight. No human is a people. I said it before, I will say it again. My parents came to this country as immigrants. I employ nine immigrants. My wife is an immigrant. My subcontract is an immigrant. I am an immigrant myself. My daughter is a daughter of an immigrant. So we are in a welcoming community. Maybe if I said something back in 2014, man, it was because of the crime that undocumented immigrants were doing. Okay? You shouldn't be labeled something that you're not. I am an immigrant. I've lived that, I've lived that progressive life. Okay? My parents are immigrants. I am an immigrant. My wife is an immigrant. I'm surrounded by immigrants. So don't get a story and twist it just because to benefit your own political game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matt, okay. Well, I would say that um, there's been numerous examples of you using the word illegals to define undocumented people. So I do think it's disingenuous to uh, get on a high horse about illegal immigration or undocumented immigrants. Um, but I will just focus on my efforts and my actions in the community, which have been thorough. Again, language liaisons double. Spanish, Portuguese, Creole uh, outreach uh, gone through the roof. I take that very seriously. When I moved to this ward, I said I'm going to represent everyone in the community, regardless of voting <coughs> record, regardless of how you vote, regardless of if you can vote. Regardless, I view everyone in this community as someone that I have to serve. And that's, I feel like you can look at my actions and determine that. And I would say actions, not words. If you can tell me some of the actions you've taken to help people in the immigrant community, I'd be more apt to believe that, but I do believe uh, I've followed you for many years, and the word illegal is used quite often when you look at it. It's a great segue into the next question. I'm going to give Matt a chance to follow up on what he's saying here. So we've established that both of you are counties. You grew up here, like me. You previously ran against each other for the same office in 2013. You have very strong ties. I know both of you for a long time. You have very strong opinions. So here's a question for you. Outside of your own experiences, either running for or serving as all of you, what are the other activities, groups, or programs that you participate in, and how do they affect the quality of life in Ward 1 specifically, or the city overall? Thank you, John. That's a great question, and it highlights, I think, a major difference between this race. Um, I got involved in the community well before I ever ran for office. I've not only been involved in numerous, numerous community groups, I've sat in numerous community groups. Uh, when I got on the Army in 2008 and I came home from Iraq, I got immediately, well, when I was in Iraq, I started a group called Save Our Summer Bowl, which dealt with all the issues that I'm addressing today. Opiate abuse, affordable housing, jobs, employment. These are the things that I've done. I started this group, and then I started another group, and then I started another group. I'm very involved in the community. I would say another thing that I'm very proud of is my work done on the Ward Democratic Committee in Summer Bowl. Uh, which before I took office was only half full, and it was very, um, there was only one demographic really in that group. Uh, I got involved, it was not my responsibility to uh, take over or to organize the Wood Democratic Committee, but I made sure to do that. I invited everybody who was previously on the committee to join, and then I filled the space with people from a broad cross section of the city. Uh, and we've since then, uh, for the state convention, Recently, we sent seven delegates. Uh, the year before that, we sent two. And this del the delegates were the first times they ever participated in a more democratic community. They didn't know the organization existed until I took part of that. Uh, so I think my experience is thorough. I go above and beyond what it is to be an alderman. I think I've transformed what it means to be an alderman beyond just the general what happens at City Hall. I'm in the streets. I'm making sure things are getting done. Thank you, Matt. Elio. Well, I'm proud to be a long-lasting member of the Ward 1 Democratic Committee. I joined when I was 18 years old. 
And um, to this day, I'm still a member of the World War Democratic Commission. And um, throughout the years, I've, I've done so much with the, uh, with the World War Democratic Commission. I'm a host staff. Uh, monthly meetings at the Bryant Manor uh, many years ago. We used to um, get together, we used to go out and um, do outreach to bring in more, uh, more members to join the, the, the World War Democratic Committee. We used to be one of the biggest thriving war uh, committees in, in the world. Um, I was a member of the CAS, the Community Action Agency, back in 2003, 2000, 2005, and we worked a lot on our projects. And I am a, um, I am a, a strong advocate of the, on the South, on the St. Benedict's uh, Parish Council um, group, my local church, when I went to school. And we, we always do um, community outreach. We try to um, build a church. In these days, the church is not, um, not as strong as it used to be. It used to be. I remember going to um, North Flower School, St. Benedict's, when we used to have uh, four masses, and we would, we'd average between three and 500, um, three and 500 um, parishioners. So that's that's my involvement in the community, and again, I'm invested in this community, and um, I, I know the community very well. This is um, talking about talking about being a townie. I remember back in the day when we used to have some of the hot shots playing at Charlestown Townies on street hockey. We'd have some real nice battles on on George Street. All right, George Street. That that shows the my, my summer boat. Um, so you know, we used to we used to play hockey on George Street, and we used to go play on. Um, on Parker Street in Charlestown. So that's uh, just wanted to put a little bit of uh, the town in me. <laughs> Thanks, Hilo. I wouldn't know about that. When I was that age, I was at the library reading Shakespeare. <laughs> 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 that's, that's, a a <laughs> that's a lie. Next question, I'm going to start with you, Ilya. Massachusetts as a whole is dealing with the opioid epidemic. What can an alderman do to help with this issue in Somerville? Have we personally observed or been affected by opioid abuse in Somerville? You know, I attended a vigil a couple weeks ago and I was touched by this woman who got up and spoke. And th this woman, she, she, she was an abuser herself and she lost three boys to opioid abuse. And that was so touching to me. All right. I, I mean, I, I just basically I got goosebumps, and after after the woman spoke up and I said, "Hey, so much courage, getting up and speaking about this um, about this epidemic." I had a worker. I had a worker uh, in 2012. Okay, I took him in because I knew he needed help. He was 21 years old. All right, he was a friend of a friend, and um, this kid needed help, and I constantly had him. And I said to him, I said, I can help you, but you need to help yourself also. Okay, this kid worked for me for four years. He, he, was, he was using, and um, I think I counseled him. And now he's a, he, he, he works. He's a successful um, salesperson for, um, for a car dealership on 114. He came out of that. So we, we need to work with the, these people. Um, we need to lobby the state legislature get more people involved with the council because a lot of these people have come from trouble troubled families and they don't have the counseling at home. Alright, so they go into the streets and they feel abandoned and they feel hopeless and we, we do a lot of but more needs to be done. More counseling needs to be done. So as an alderman I would put forth um, an order to work with um, the state and um, congressional leadership to, to make sure that the funding is always there so that they get the care and need that they need because it's, it's, it's spiraling out of control. I mean, it's an epidemic that's really spiraling out of control. And the, the, the resources need to be available so that we don't leave, we're not losing these kids because there's a lot of talent out there and if they just get the counseling needed, they'll find a way to help themselves. Thank you, Elliot. Matt McLaughlin. Yes, thank you, Joe, for that question. And I attended the vigil as well, as well as the previous three before that. And I also helped found some of the common addiction. I assisted other people to found that organization, and they control it, and they run it the way that they see fit. I'm very proud to support them in their efforts. Uh, opiate ep epidemic was the one and two reasons why I ran for office to begin with, opiate epidemic and affordable housing. These are the things that impacted my life growing up. 
Uh, I served in the military and we lost more people from opiate abuse than the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. And again, the first thing I did when I got on the board, within weeks, I said I would like the police and fire department to carry Narcan and the city was happy to oblige and I was very happy for that. And just a personal story, I had a friend that I played football with, uh, found out that he overdosed one day, he was revived by Narcan. And after that, he got his life together. He's doing well, he's clean, and I'm proud to know that I played a small part in making sure that there was one less mother who was uh, seeing her child die in the city. Uh, there's more that needs to be done. Uh, we've done a lot of criminal justice reform in the city. I was happy, uh, one of the things I did, a uh, basic fact, a basic thing, when uh, we had resistat meetings and the police brought up their data about crime, I would always ask, what are the drug crimes? What is the drug crime percentage? And I would repeatedly ask, and they say, oh, well, you know, we can get you that information. I said, no, I want the public to have that information. I want people to know what's going on in the community. And because of that, and because of other efforts that I've worked with the police and substance abuse treatment groups, uh, we have a great criminal justice uh, system in Somerville where we prioritize treatment over incarceration. People can actually go to the police station and say, I have a problem, I need help. And instead of arresting them, they're going to find help for them. Uh, there's a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, we do have medical marijuana clinics coming to Somerville, which is going to generate millions of dollars of tax revenue. Alderman Conway and myself and everyone on the board agreed that we'd like to see that money get put into treatment because there's just not enough money on the state and federal level to deal with this. Thank you, Matt. Right on time. We're going to get into some issues about development, affordable housing. The developers are here. It looks like Ward 1 in the eastern part of the city has a target on its back. Along with Assembly Road will come Union Square, Boynton Yards, and everything in between. The eastern part of the city is sure to face a lot of challenges in the coming years. So here's a question, Matt. What does smart economic development mean to you, and how do you plan on promoting it? Well, that's a great question, Joe, and I would say smart economic development, in my mind, the phrase I would use is development without displacement. It means that we thrive as a community, but people aren't getting left behind. Too much uh, progress that we have in the city is at the detriment of the people who need the most help. Uh, that's why I was a huge advocate for the 20% affordable housing rate. I'd like to see it even go higher when we go to the citywide zoning, which would be a huge benefit to developers. I would say, um, for me, Smart Economic Development, one of the things that I'm very proud to do is to work with the East Somerville Main Streets Design and Review Committee. Any time, any time a development comes to this neighborhood, I run it by them, I run it by the experts, people who know what smart development looks like. And I try to deliver for them all the time. And I think this is a group that is not a NIMBY group, they're not resisting development, but they want smart development, they want smart growth. Uh, so I always run things by them, I always talk to the experts, I'm not a complete expert myself, but I listen to the community and what they want out of the community. Um, in the new zoning coming up, there's tremendous opportunity. You mentioned Innovelt Road, you mentioned a few places where we could use some developers. Uh, we could use a lot of work down there. Uh, and people should be allowed to build their houses as they see fit, fit, as long as the community is a part of that. Too often I find that developments get done without community process, without community input. They're largely ignored. We go to the planning and zoning board, and it feels like a rubber stamp. And people say that to me all the time. And I worked hard over four years to try to build a relationship so that I could negotiate on behalf of the community. I don't feel that the city is vulnerable that we're getting a fair shake from the planning and zoning boards. I think that needs to be examined as well. And that's everything. Thank you, Matt. Elio, your family business is right smack dab in the middle that's of right. this. What does smart economic growth or smart economic development mean to you, and how do you plan on promote it? Well, that's an easy question. The gentrification of East Somerville, and with the easy accessibility from two train stations and, and the third one on the way, the Green Line, and Interstate 93, Route 28, and, and Route 38 makes it real easy for developers to come here and take over our neighborhoods. But when the developer comes here, they have to build to our liking, not the liking of what they want. Okay? Four years ago, I ran for Alderman, and we had four uh, uh, developments that were approved. Two of them since have gotten up on the speed. 
but the other two are dumping grounds. One is right across the street, and one is on um, Washington Street. We can't afford that. We're missing the boat. Okay, there's so much going to be that's going to be happening in Union Square, but we need to make sure that whatever gets built here is built by what the neighborhood wants, and we need to hold our developers accountable because when something is built, we're the ones that are going to look that are going to look with it. Because when a developer comes in and cashes in, they're gone, and then it affects our quality of life. So we need to make it affordable. I definitely agree with the inclusionary rate, the 20%. If we can move to 25%, that's probably even better. But we need to make sure that whatever we're building in our neighborhoods is what the neighborhood wants, not what a special interest group wants. So we need to prioritize our priorities now and not pay the consequence. <coughs> Thanks, Elia. We're going to stay with that for a little bit. So most of you know that Somerville is a very, very desirable and sexy city to be. Developers have been here for the last 10 years, and they're going to be here for the next 30. When any de big, deep-pocketed developer comes into this city, there is what they call mitigation. Mitigation means you want to play in this city, you want to build in this city, you owe us something. In the past, those were negotiated by people in City Hall. There has been a call for what they call Community Benefits Agreements, or CBAs. That means that the developer will provide the potential for infrastructure updates funded by their private development. So down here in East Somerville, if CBA funds were allotted to the East Somerville District, what are the top three things you'd like to see addressed in this ward? Let's go with you, Matt. Oh, uh, yes, Joe. Uh, before that, I'd like to address a couple of things that you pointed out, too, um, because the CBAs are a big thing that I want community benefits agreement so that we don't have to go through this, hey, I'm the alderman, let's make a deal, so it should be a community benefits agreement, which is what we're going for. That's why I voted against the Union Square zoning. I was the only person on the board to vote against Union Square zoning because uh, we didn't have those community benefits locked up beforehand. We should have community benefits first and then talk about development second. Uh, it's also why I'm very concerned about the $200 million that we're gonna invest in infrastructure in Union Square when places like East Somerville desperately need infrastructure as well. That's going to favor the developers. The developers. Uh, it's very necessary, the infrastructure, but you know, if people need it to, then we should be talking about that. Uh, your question though, uh, what would I want the money to go towards? What would my benefits go towards? Affordable housing, first and foremost. Green and open space would be another one because a lot of developments like the Union Square deal, I felt didn't have enough open space and open space can actually help increase the profitability of a, build, of a business and a building uh, by beautifying it and making it a nice place. Open space, affordable housing, uh, those would be two that come to mind. Thank you, Matt. Elio, community uh, benefit agreements. I absolutely support community benefits for this. I support this measure because we need to make it affordable to live in the city. Too many people are getting displaced. We're losing our families. We have smart people in the city. And we have families in the city that just cannot afford to live here and we're moving elsewhere. So I definitely support this measure. We should put our Somerville residents first because they are the ones that are gonna invest in our community. So we need to find measures that we're gonna, we're gonna keep our residents here and we're not gonna lose them because we have a great school system. We have a school system that's gonna get even better when the new high school is built. So we need to find ways and measures to make it affordable for our families to live here. Like my family decided to in 1967, they came here, and that's why we are best in this community. A lot of my, a lot of my, a lot of my friends were fortunate enough to, to live here and had no wealth. They were displaced, so we need an agreement between the city and the developer to keep our residents here and our families here first. Gilly, yeah, can I just ask a follow-up? What are the top three things that you'd like to see addressed? Well, going going to on development or issues of the ward? The CBA. The CBA will give you a bunch of money. Well, the C we, we have, we have, we want to put the money toward 
with our teachers, with our workers, with, 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 with the people that keep the city safe. So we need to, we need to make sure that that money is being spent wisely. All right, we have we have teachers in the in the city that need the money. We have workers that need the money, and you know we have police and fire. We need to keep the money within these types of, of um, departments and, and, and you know people that that, that, that need the money. Thanks, Elio. We're going to wrap this up with one final question, and it's about a subject that I think is on everyone's mind in this city, and it has to do with affordable housing. So what kind of people do you think are most affected by affordable housing initiatives, or the lack of those initiatives, and how do you plan on addressing them? Explain your views, the current initiatives that are out there, comment on how you perceive the need for affordable rentals versus the need for affordable properties to purchase? How will preserving affordable rentals affect the character of this city? And how will preserving affordable properties for purchase affect the character of the city? I don't think I have to explain a whole lot about affordable housing. Um, it's affectionately referred to now as unaffordable housing. So if you want me to repeat any parts of that, I can. I'll give it a shot, Joe. You're right. There's uh, multiple questions are killing me. But <laughs> uh, yeah, let me know if I miss anything. Um, so first of all, again, I was very proud of the 20% affordable housing increase. And I would say we should go up to 25%. Uh, the Summer Vision and the MAPC studies have all said that we need regionally 30% affordable housing in order to maintain the population that we have today to not have displacement. Uh, so this affects lower class people, it affects people struggling just to survive, it affects middle class people uh, who are trying to raise their family here, start a family, my fiance and I would like to own a home in the city and it's just out of reach. We put in four offers for homes in this community and we cannot get a deal. Uh, so it affects middle class, it affects lower class, it affects long time homeowners uh, and people who own their properties because the taxes are going up in this community. And was the plan, as I've sat in board meetings, I've seen that the plan for the raise taxes incrementally every year for the next 30 years to pay for the high school, to pay for our taxes, to pay for the water bills. The plan is to increase everything, and that's the last stage of gentrification of people who own their homes and they want to stay in this community. They can't do that anymore. And I don't see a real plan to address that. Uh, there's only one thing we can really do, well, there's several things. Increase the affordable housing stock. I'd like to look into right of first refusal, which would be a uh, person whose house is being converted. They have the first option to buy that house. It doesn't cost the homeowner anything. It doesn't cost the city anything, but it gives that person the option to buy if they're capable of buying. Uh, and then the main thing, the number one issue in the city in terms of displacement is economic inequality. Uh, the number one reason why your taxes are going up, the reason why people can't afford to live here in one of the most prosperous times in the history of the city is because the homeowners are paying the overwhelming burden, 70% of all taxes are paid by homeowners in the city. And that trickles down to the renters as well. And we have billion dollar interests in the city that are getting tax deals. Uh, Assembly Square got 50 million, 200 million for infrastructure for Union Square, Partners Healthcare got an amazing deal on taxes, Tufts University. These are the billion dollar institutions that we see everywhere in, this, in the city. And they need to pay their fair share. If we had that happen, then we could deal with a lot of issues. Thank you, Matt. Elio. Families, the elderly, disabled, and veterans are the ones feeling the pinch. As I've been going door to door, I got people on fixed incomes that I speak with who cannot afford to live here, who've been here 50, 60 years. It's not acceptable. A person, a person in, in the rural square. Um, he's, he's selling his home, and it's becoming a bidding war. All right, we can't afford to have that. Somebody wants to, so a developer wants to come in and buy a three-family home. It becomes a bidding war. I mean, that's unacceptable. It's driving the families out. We can't afford to have that. We need to hold developers to their feet. The fight to their feet. Assembly Square, Tufts, they need to start paying their fair share. Because right now, you know who's paying the fair share? The people that are working every day. Okay, I run a business. Okay, I, I know how it is to pay my taxes. I know how it is to make a payment. <laughs> and it's, it's unacceptable. I mean, I, I, 
I employ families who will say to me, I can't live here, I can't live in Somerville. I have to move out to Lynn, where, where my rent is half the amount that, that it is in Somerville. So, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to build, but if you can't afford to live here, you're gonna make, you're gonna pass the, the buck on to the, to the tenant who's paying $1,800 for an affordable house in the world. That's not affordable. Can somebody afford to pay $1,800 and then pay your all year round, you know, the, the bills that come with it? No. So we need to make it affordable to live in this city. And we need to hold the developers' feet to the fire. Because ultimately, they're the ones that are going to come in, they're going to cash in, and they're going to say bye bye to some of them, and they're going to go to the next town and they're going to do the same. Thank you, Eli. So, moderate, moderate gets to ask a follow up to that. Part of that question was what's the right mix? Do we build all affordable housing that is rental only? Or do we build affordable housing that can be purchased by low income? Middle income families. Because I think I've heard it many, many times, and many people in the audience have heard it, is that that middle class is getting priced out of here as well. Matt, you want to take it? Yes, uh, well, I'd say, uh, again, MAPC and the uh, Summer Vision all said that 30% is what's necessary to maintain the population. The city has a plan of uh, building six to 9,000 new units in the city. I'd feel a lot better about that if I knew that there were going to be affordable units. Home ownership is a very important thing to me, which is why I proudly supported the affordable housing development on the corner of uh, Glen and Tuff Street, which is affordable ownership. So it has three tiers. It has low income, it has middle income, and it has market rate. They're all ownership. It allows people the opportunity to own their homes, uh, and they would you know, be invested in this community. Uh, so I think that's something that I'd like to see happen. Uh, I definitely think it's a balance. You know, People want to own their homes. Some people don't want to own their homes. It's the housing stuff that's an issue. So we need more units. Thank you, Matt. Billy? I would like to see how many people at the corner of Tuff Street and Glen Street that are some of the residents that have applied that are getting that, those units. From the last time I inquired, none of them. And that's wrong because some of the residents should be getting some of the homes and some of the units that we built affordable. We'll leave it at that. I think that's completely inaccurate, Elio. Uh, First of all, the city does have requirements for residential permission. People have that permit. We prioritize some of our residents first. State and federal housing does not allow us to do that by law. If you're going to put affordable housing on your platform and on your campaign, you should know that. Well, Matt, I think that the, the crunch that we have in the city and in this ward especially, we should encourage more some of our residents to be applying for these affordable we housing that. units. We do because that. from the last time I checked, some of the, when some of the resident is getting a unit, how do you um, check at at um, at cross at uh, tops and ones? That's not accurate, gentlemen. I wish you had done this in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> we reached the end of this debate. So, how about if we start with a closing statement by Elio Caruso? Once again, I'd like to thank East Somerville Main Street's Connection, uh, Joe Lynch, Somerville Media Center, and Justin for welcoming us here to have a, um, a nice debate on the issues. My question to you is, do you want someone with deep roots in World One, someone that is best in World One, as a property owner, business owner, and someone who has already pushed the progressive ideology of an immigrant son, a father, a husband, and a friend of the community. I am the son of Ward One, and I am a vested person in the community. Tonight you heard our differences between me and my opponent. It was a healthy discussion. We touched on many very important issues. The same issues that persisted four years ago are still at the forefront. Affordable housing, blighted empty lots, we did a touch on rodents, which is a big, big issue in this world. Just to name a few. It's the people who live here that make it so special. I will work tirelessly to make some of the best place to, the best place to live, work, play, and raise a family. As Alderman, I will deliver a transparent 
and effective government for all. It will be a privilege to work alongside the Ward 1 residents to get these issues resolved. I remember the days of helping out my dad plant his garden on George Street. And today I'm, I was so happy that I learned how to do that because now I'm doing it. Playing street hockey against the Charlestown Townies and knowing who my neighbors were. That's all about keeping our families here in the city and making it affordable for them to remain here. And to add one thing, when I'm elected officer, I will pick up the phone and call the right department head. I will not have to put in 600 orders to get the job done. That's why I humbly ask for your vote to be Alderman of Ward 1 on Tuesday, November 7th, and I will not let you down. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Elio. Closing statement, Matt McCall. Yes, thank you all, and thank you, Elio, for pointing out my 600 uh, board orders that I've submitted. Thank you, Teresa Hussey, who worked in the DPW, who the moment I walked in the door said, hey, Matt, I took care of the seven orders you placed last week. So thank you all, the people who work in the city, who are very responsive to what I do in the community. I'm a man of actions and not words. I can talk a good game, but I follow it up with actions. I've delivered on all the promises that I've made in 2013 which is quite an accomplishment for considering the position of Alderman to begin with. I'm accessible to the community. I always reach out to people by the internet, by email, by knocking on their doors, by being involved, invested in this community. And I use invested the correct term. Um, I am involved, in, in, involved in this community. I encourage you to both all examine both of our track records, see who has accomplished something, see who hasn't. I've been heavily invested in this community and I'm proud to be from the city and I'm proud to represent Ward 1. Uh, we need leaders who are willing to work and I'm the person who works and I believe I've proved it time and time again. I'm looking forward to move forward on other issues like the sound barriers along R93, like more affordable housing, like shifting the tax burden from homeowners to commercial development. Very proud to be here. Thank you all for coming. I hope I can get your vote on November 7th. Ladies and gentlemen, these are your candidates for Alderman in Ward 1. Before we go, I would like to point out that we do have um, another elected official who came in late. Uh, the state representative for this district of Somerville, Mike Conley, is here. We also have... We also have another late arrival running for Alderman at large as Will Mba. In the back. East Somerville Main Street, thank you so much for allowing me to come in and uh, sit in your living room for the night. My best wishes to both candidates, Elio LaRusso, Matt McLaughlin. Please remember to vote on November 7th. For Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Thank you very much.